John C. McGinley. Hello, John. Good to see everybody again. Hey, Good John. to see you. Look at the great shape that John C. McGinley's in. Every Fight time gravity. I see you, it's it's uh, it's amazing. What do you do to stay in shape? Um, chase an eight and a ten year old and a twenty one year old with special needs all around southern Los Angeles, Southern California. That's, that does it. Hey, <laughs> come here. Hey, don't hit her. Oh, <laughs> uh, the children. Yeah, that's the the children's. You know, I wish Oprah would do a thing. Uh, you know, all they ever do is diets, right? Mm -hmm. Try the stress diet. <laughs> oh yeah, that'll thin your ass up. <laughs> Sprinkle some stress on it. Yeah, stress really yeah. does. Or depression. Depression's a really good one too. Yes. Yeah, the depression diet's rough. Yeah, it is. Well, it can go either way, right? Some people go the wrong way with depression diets. Some people they fatten up. Yeah, some people fatten mm. up. And then there's other times where you just depressed. can't eat. Yes. Yeah, just but most eat. most male Irish donkeys. Are of which I am one. <laughs> Since we just blame ourselves for everything and just we just want to slam our head through drywall. Yeah. And so that the stress diet's great for us. Are you a puncher? Do you punch walls and stuff? No, I, I bang my forehead into things. You do? Really? Wow. Yes. That's almost Rain Man-ish. Yeah, it's really dysfunctional. So you you've uh, you've have you ever hurt your head doing that? No. What do, what do you normally hit with your head? Drywall. Oh, it is. You were yeah. just, wow. Drywall like, gives a little. That's the key. Yes. Yeah. As long as you're not on the stud. Right. right. <laughs> Have you made that mistake? Yes. Yeah, you look, for the, you look for the nail marks and make sure there's no nail Don't marks. Hit the nail marks. Yeah. <laughs> if you hit the stud, it's not going anywhere. So when you need to smash your face into something, do you specifically look for drywall? No, it's just whatever's close. Right. You just, I, I need That to... makes me think of, do you remember the first time we found out what was in those highway barriers in speed when those yellow buckets, when Keanu finally hits it and they're full of water? Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah, and you never really right. knew that. Before what the hell they were in that thing. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Don't ask me why I just thought of so that. So you've been banging your head your whole life? No, as an adult. You just started as an adult? Yeah. I take it you're sober. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so but what is the stress? Because I think a lot of people look at you, and if you're gonna be a working actor, you have a pretty ideal career in the oh, sense yeah. that you've been working forever. You've been working regularly, like you're in everything, you're always in something. There's always something that you're doing, it seems like you've got, a, as far as actors go, a pretty great life. Yeah, this has been, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a worker bee. I've, I didn't, once I got on that film train, like a couple years out of school, uh, I got in, I got in a film and then it seemed like once you got on that, that kind of, that motion of getting on that train and you get in that fraternity of, of New York actors who, who can be put in as the number six, seven, and eight guy. And then, you know, you climb the ladder a little bit, but I never got off the film train. I was just doing five or six films a year and, uh, I didn't have any criteria for what they could or couldn't be. It wasn't, you know, if you're, you're 24, 25, 26, 27, <coughs> eight years old, you just go. Yeah. And then one seemed to lead to another. I have no idea if that's true, but they did seem to lead to each other. Was Platoon the third thing you did? He, uh, I was, so third film, yeah. The third wow. film. How'd you pull that up? I was, I was looking at your IMDb. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it's Jim, just tell him you know it. Yeah, I got hired Don't by... Don't tell him that you're looking at that. No, I'm going to have to look back anyway. Oh, you uh, will. Okay. Wall Street was right after that. Wow. It was like a year after that. Yep. And born on the 4th of July. Jeez. Well, that's what he means. One leading to the other. Right. It helps when Oliver Stone is that's actively true. making films and goes, I like you. Yes. Yeah. And plus, people tem tend to, to buy the noise. Uh, you know, the, if, if you're good enough for Oliver, you must be good for Bob. Right. And, uh, people buy that stuff. And so uh, we, we traded on that for a while. That if you were in Wall Street and and, and Platoon, uh, but then I did talk radio at the public for two years, and then Oliver optioned it, and then he shot that. So that just right. was completely coincidental. I I had that had nothing to do with Oliver till he bought it, mm -hmm. and then he put Eric in it, and I had created the role, which is what you say when you're the first guy who did it. Uh, and then we went down to Dallas and we shot it in <clears throat> four or five weeks. So what stresses you out then is kind of the question. Like if you start working early, right, you're in your 20s, you're doing really well. Like you said, you never got off the train. You got a series, Stand Against Evil, you're staying. You know what I mean? It, it, what, what is stressful? Being a better father, trying to participate in a more active way in creating bridges in this, between the special needs community and, and people who disparage people with Down syndrome, trying to raise more money for autism awareness and autism research, because everybody who has Down syndrome will get autism mm. uh, or, or is, is either double diagnosed and will get Alzheimer's. And so I'm obsessed oh, wow. with Alzheimer's and 
as it impacts our community, the Down syndrome community. And so stuff like that. Yeah. Stuff that I can't sleep about thinking how I can communicate better with people to um, maybe find a better word than retard and retarded and how much that hurts our community and uh, stuff like that stresses me out. How and many get you angry? Yes. Yeah. How many kids are special needs? Yeah. Uh, my son, Max, was born with Down syndrome. Okay. And he's a 21 year old. He's great. Uh, he's working at Starbucks and wow. he's doing his thing. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are not doing their thing and they, it's a struggle. It's a, every day is a struggle. So that's, that's what stresses me out. Yeah. Man, I would I, imagine. I didn't know that the, it leads to, uh, Alzheimer's. No, you Alzheimer's. will. It doesn't lead to, you will get, if you live long enough uh -huh. and you were born with Down syndrome, you will arrive at Alzheimer's. I so that know. makes yeah, my no group idea. really a special research, a uh, Petri dish research, because we will not get hard fatty tumors. So how come you won't get hard fatty tumors, but you will get Alzheimer's? Mm -hmm. And for baby boomers, there's about to be an avalanche of Alzheimer's, and there's no infrastructure in place for it. Nobody knows what it is, aside from bl brain plaque. Nobody knows what to do about it. There's uh, a, a lot of us are going to get Alzheimer's, a lot. Mm -hmm. and there's nothing there's nothing yeah and so all of a sudden that makes the down syndrome community in a research capacity very valuable and we've traded on that wow that's wow. enabled us to raise money yeah i mean totally because because you can see right here okay we know this is going to happen correct so Why? we can start here right plus it's the disadvantage of living longer you know we're designed to live like what 40 or 50 years maximum the body is that true yeah my doctor i had a doctor tell me that's why you break down he said your body is designed to live 45 years or whatever everything else is medicine and science so like all the shit that happens when you get old all these cancers and all these things it's part of it is just because we're, we're that's really interesting making ourselves live longer you the know technology hasn't fully caught up yeah to because of the design of the machine yeah, it's supposed, you know, well, I hate to quote the machine breaks down, we break down. I shouldn't yeah. quote your films, but, you know, <laughs> but, but it is, that's what happens. You're supposed to break down after a certain time and drop dead, but now we can live to our 80. Yeah. And all this shit goes wrong. Yeah. Man. Fucking brain falls apart, or you got oh. tumors. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. just bummed because I, I got rejected by Starbucks. <laughs> Years ago, <laughs> I get Max to write you a, a letter. <laughs> Please, a recommendation. Need a rec. yeah. That's my son's name, Max. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, do you like uh, Do you like working on on the series in the sense that it's regular work? I mean, obviously, it's a lot more work than a film, right? And especially going on in the third season. I'm the producer of Stand Against Evil, mm -hmm. and the most the only reason I tell you that <clears throat> is because what I get to do as a producer, the number one thing I get to do is shepherd the tone. Like somebody here has to decide how you guys, the tone of this show, or maybe collectively you do. Mm -hmm. But with Stan, because it's a horror comedy, tone-wise, it lives, if the, if the two ends, the extremes of the spectrum, are The Exorcist, which is really scary, but you cannot drop a joke in The Exorcist, and Scooby-Doo, which is funny, but the- At times scary. Uh, but not really. <laughs> did you get scared by Scooby-Doo? I uh, certainly did, yeah. Scooby -Doo? Yes, I did, the mystery Hello, van. Poker tell. <laughs> um, and so we live right in the middle there, somewhere, where, where our witches are, I want them scary, but I don't want them to cannibalize the jokes. And I don't mm. want the jokes to be at the witch's expense. And so it's right in the middle there with an American werewolf in London, the mm -hmm. one that we grew up watching right. um, with Griffin Dunn, not the remake. Um, and that's a hard, hard tone to maintain. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's really easy to get sloppy that the jokes, you can just, you know, you can just take the, the piss Evil out of the Evil Dead witches. had certain moments that worked too, because that was a really scary yeah. movie. Yeah, absolutely. Great. And, and, um, and Bruce, oh my God. Campbell. Bruce Campbell's really funny. The best. So that kind of worked where they didn't That's compromise hard. scary stuff. They for just got canceled kids. though. The what? series. Oh, yeah, I'm thinking of the film. Series, yeah. I was thinking of no, the film. I know, like, but uh, it, yeah. it led to Ash and Bruce, who I did a, a an arc with on uh, on Burn Notice down in Miami, and he's great. And that show, I guess, it went for four or five years. And they were doing the same thing. It was comedy hard. They had a much bigger budget than us, and so we have to make do or do without. But the trade off for having a tiny budget is that they gave they give us almost complete creative autonomy, mm -hmm. which is fabulous. Uh, it's also a 
a, a pain in the ass. You have to, okay, here, you have the keys to the car. And if it right. shits the bed, it's on you. Exactly. Bang. There's no one to blame but you. I'm mm. good with that. And it's Standing Against Evil, it pre- it's season three, is on IFC October 31st. It starts, I like, guess, Halloween night, 10 yep. p.m., which is a good time because a lot of people are home by then, at least younger people are home by then. <laughs> um, you did also, you, you were in a play that I almost went to see, but I overslept. Uh, <laughs> I had, because uh, uh, Bobby Cannavale and Pacino, I wanted to see Pacino play Shelley in, uh, I, 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 Glenn Gary. in Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and um, I, I, who are you in that? Um, I was the straw, the straw that stirs the drink. Uh, I'll think of his name in a the second. The Ed Harris character? Uh, wait, hold on. Not, uh, oh my God. I'll think of it in a second. Um, I know, it's driving me crazy too. My brain has lapses. Where he's, where he's, yeah, that was the greatest experience of mine. Dave Moss. I got to Dave play Moss. Dave Moss, and he he kind of is the catalyst for everything that goes wrong in that play. And kind of all he was uh, Ricky Romo, right? Yes, he was bulletproof. He he's great. Wow. The ensemble. Then David Harbour, who's now the star of Stranger Things, yeah. uh, played in that with us as well. So the ensemble and Richard Schiff uh, played Arano. And so that was, the, that was the greatest experience of my acting life. It was, right? Yes. I saw that with Alan Alda playing Shelley Levine. Great. Yeah, it was really great. was in it. Leah played Ricky Romney, yeah. I heard it was great. Jeffrey Tambor. Yeah, I loved it. Wow. Good, good pretty good ensemble. Yeah. Yeah, the movie's hard to top. I mean, the, the movie with the, with the well, cast. Yeah, but the play's very different than the movie. Here's why. The movie unfolds very casually on this rainy night. And right. we keep we keep going back and forth from different places, and thing the the meter uh, the pace of the movie is much more casual than the play. The first act of the play is about thirty two minutes, and you're out on Forty Fourth Street wondering what the hell just happened, and then you come back and the office has been robbed and all hell is. Right. How did this start the play? I don't remember the play. It's been the play starts uh, in three different. Um, tables at the Chinese restaurant. Their first one is where uh, Shelley, the machine, Levine, is trying to get some leads from the head of the office. Then the stage goes black, and then it comes up. You're at another table. You're with me and Richard Schiff, and I'm telling Richard Schiff he should rob this place. And then you, the stage goes black, and you come up on Bobby Cannavale trying to, uh, trying to con a mark. That's right. That's the end of the first act. And it happens. It's, it's a freight train. And it's David Mamet wrote it. He told me he wrote it as a one act, but you can't win a Tony with a one act on Broadway. <laughs> so he broke it up. He put it in. Oh, really? For that, did so it win anything? Say again. Did, did he get what he wanted? Did it win anything? I can't remember. Um, that was right. That was like 1982, 1983. I went to the original two nights in a row. Um, so it was a little. Who's in the original? Of, do you remember? Uh, yeah, Joe Montagna uh, created oh. the role of, and then all those Chicago actors. That Who was, did Joe play? Uh, Roma. Oh, he did. Yeah, he he's cre- so good. He created it in Chicago. He came with it, and that was during the Chicago invasion of New York. From Steppenwolf to Mammoth's group, um, they just all the Chicago actors, Malkovich, Sinise, they invaded New York. It was right when I was going to school, and uh, they just brought a whole this whole new vibrance and sledgehammer to the theater. I remember like it was yesterday. He was great in fucking House of Games. Another Mammoth, uh, Joe Montagna. Mm-hmm. Oh. He's the best. Yeah. What was your What was the greatest experience before that? You said that you knew then. This is the greatest experience of my acting career. What What did it beat out? What was before that? And I don't mean beat out like competitively, but just wondering. I guess what I, was... guess, I guess Platoon. Yeah. Uh, was the most intense and the most well realized because you're at home and you're reading a script and you obviously you see it in your brain as you're reading it and you cast it and you do all these things and you have a million different imaginations about these words. And then it never realizes fruition, and it's it's desperately disappointing when you put four months of your life aside, you go to some random faraway place, and then the film comes out and it sucks, and you can't have the time back, and it's not the way you saw it, but you're just a hired gun on it. You're an actor. You came, you hit your spot, you said your lines, you poured all your stuff into it, and then the film sucks, and it just it takes little pieces of you away, and it smashes them, and so when they when the when from the script through you and the director and then up on the screen it it's it comes somewhere near what you thought about when you read that thing Mm -hmm. it's thrilling and it hardly ever happens does that still affect you because i mean you've done so much stuff that's worked 
You know what I mean? You've yeah, done, you've had you a lot of- you pour your life into something. Yeah. You know, maybe you take two months beforehand to either research or you bring your acting teacher in and you break the script down and you deconstruct the words and then you put them back together and now you ship off away from your family for a while. Or maybe you bring your family with you and now you're in it and you're getting it all over you and you're folk, you got blinders on like a Kentucky Derby horse and this is what we're doing. And then four months later it comes out and somebody shit the bed and you just want to punch somebody in the fucking esophagus. <laughs> 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 Do you get embarrassed? Why? Because we, we, Jim and we were watching a movie that he and I did, and it was not a particularly good film. It's horrible. Oh, you're being hard on and yourself. And I cringe watching it. Like, do you when you watch something like that? Do you go like, oh, or do you get annoyed, or do you get embarrassed? I get annoyed. You don't get embarrassed. No, because you have enough faith in in your work. Where you're I like, know I, what I did. Wait, he's yeah. a real he's a real actor <laughs> too, right? No, yeah, the see, only yeah. time see, the, the issue time with I their film mistake. was their performances, so that's why it's embarrassing. Yeah, I'm yeah. humiliated by me. Yeah. I I for some reason was having an artistic man crush on Orson Welles about and his voice um, primarily. I think he'd already passed, and I was I got cast in Highlander number two. And so I had to go down to Buenos Aires with Sean Connery, and, and so it was this, this big thing, and I was going to finally get paid after, you know, you don't get paid for a platoon, and you should be so lucky to be in Wall Street, and you don't get paid for all this shit. And finally, we made a stand, and, uh, you know, I think I was going to get 50 grand to go down to Buenos Aires and play the third bad guy. And so I decided that since I didn't occupy that much real estate in the film, I was going to, you were going to hear me differently. And so... I decided I was going to lower my voice about two octaves. And so I hired a voice teacher here in New York. This one I was living in the West Village. And I just brought my voice way down. Based on, it wasn't supported by anything in the text. <laughs> Did it help the film? No. It, it looked like that it was bad looping on my voice. It looked like they put some other actor's voice. Every time I spoke in the film, I looked like a fucking donkey. What's the movie called? <laughs> Highlander number two. Troy? <laughs> Pull it up. Just horrible. And, and you and you look back on that and go, wish you had not made that choice. Well, what were you, McGinley, what were you thinking lowering your voice two octaves? What do you, what do you, you gotta get your head out of your ass sometimes. You like Orson Welles. And look around. Yeah. You ever see Citizen Kane? Uh, live and die for Citizen <laughs> Kane, but I, I just wanted to be way down here and I thought it would be much more threatening. And it's like, dude, just say the lines. But okay. you're working with Connery. That's got to be fun. He, uh, Sean, uh, uh, I dumped, I've done two with him. It's not that fun. Welcome oh, no, to is he rock. hard? Uh, he does three takes and goes, well, he used to just do three takes. I did the rock with him as well. Do three takes and go back to his trailer. And mm. it's like, really? There's 160 of us here, and you can do three fucking takes and go back to your trailer? Mm -hmm. So he's dead. like, you got three. <laughs> <I> tried, <laughs> and I said, Did you fight yep. with him? No, no. I didn't have any interaction with him all, at all. Uh, on The Rock? Let's see. No, not. Oh, yeah. He fight. We we have a battle to the death in The Rock. Uh, yeah. Or with his stuntman. And uh, <laughs> he'll do three takes regardless of how good they are, or he'll come back and do more, but he has to do three? Three. Wow. Trailer. Does he always nail it? Uh, his career was pretty good. Yeah, so like he'll he'll hit it at one point. <laughs> I guess. I mean, you're going to get Sean Connery. He's not going to all of a sudden do Elephant Man. You know, he does that guy. So right. direct direct has no say in the matter if he wants to do if direct and needs a fourth or fifth take. You don't want to piss him. off Connery. Not really. It's true. Because even if you're good, you should still be a part of the process, sure. right? You're still a piece of the puzzle. Not hundred percent. Yeah. Especially if we're out on Alcatraz and there's a you know 160 man crew, 40 40 actors who have 200 people. You think we could go again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what would he do? He'd just say no and go back to the trailer? I guess it was, no, it wasn't even that. It was standard operating procedure. Like it's contracted or something. You got three takes, Maybe. max. I don't know. I yeah. just, again, I was hired guns on these, and uh, I always just felt like Sean was going to hand me his golf club bag and tell me to carry it to the next hole at any given second. <laughs> so he's kind of royalty, and he knows he's royalty. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but you're yeah. like, you know, by, by the time The Rock is out, you're like, I've done some work too, Sean. You know, I'm a little yeah. bit He's James Bond. He's a legend. Yeah, I, yeah but still. There's, 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 all, there's, there's, there's a hierarchy. Everyone man. on set watched Connery as a kid. <laughs> yeah. like, everyone Fact. watched. They said, Tom Cruise said that when they did A Few Good Men, because I'm wondering if you ever fanboy out. He said when Nicholson was on set at that point, e even people who were used to it and used to being around people, there's a, feel, there's a feeling that something is different when he was there. Nicholson. Like on, the, on the days yeah. that Jack was on set, yeah. Um, I, I haven't, I haven't fanboyed out with, um, actors. I, I, I think I did it with athletes more. Mm. Uh, like I, I saw Don Mattingly once and having grown up a Yankee fanatic, I just, I had nothing to say. 
Yeah. I was like, it's Don, it's, it's Donnie baseball. I'm like, I didn't have anything to say. I was at that final game that he played in Yankee Stadium. I think it was it was the against Seattle five game series in '95. And f- this is how stupid I am. Ruben Sierra hits a home run. I'm going in to get a hot dog. Mattingly's up. He had like fucking seven homers and 49 runs bad in that year. It was a terrible year because it was back. And his final home run in Yankee Stadium in that playoff game, I'm buying a hot dog. <laughs> and I'm watching on a TV monitor. <laughs> I was there with you. I was at the game. Were, were, are you yeah. with you with that? Yeah. Do you remember did you that? Get to, yeah. Did you get to see the home run? Yeah. I'll Norm never, did not. I stayed in my seat. I will <laughs> never. Because he was having such a bad year. I figured it was time, a good time to go get a thing. Yeah. Yeah. You figured wrong. I, dude, I will never forget ordering. Right. There was nobody in front of me and watching it and hearing the roar of the crowd. Oh. I was like, you asshole. You know wow. how you know that your decision <laughs> oh, that, was a bad one? Kills me. <laughs> nobody was in front of you. Everybody knew we should oh, stay in our seats. Right. Dude, there was no line. There, there weren't was... even flat screens back there. It was a fucking tube TV. <laughs> oh. Piece of shit tube TV. Everybody knows what they're seeing except Jim. And Damn Ruben it. Sierra, I was almost out. I was walking down and I was walking like around right before you go back down those the hallway. Yeah. And, I, and 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 Ruben, I, I want to say Ruben was right before him. I think he was. I don't remember. Well, what do you right. What do you think? This, they got a shot against the Red Sox, the Yankees. You still absolutely like Yankee fan? that last series of the season. Now the Red Sox fans are like, we weren't even trying. We weren't using our starters. I don't care. That last series at the end of the season, to me, it was tantamount to the Giants giving that undefeated Patriots team all they could eat that last I game that. of the undefeated season, and then they were twelve point dogs in the Super Bowl, and they beat them, of course. But um, at the Meadowlands, that final score was like 42-38 or something. Yeah. But the Giants gave them all they could eat. And this feels like that. This feels like every everybody's starting to get back into a groove. Everybody's hel- – not everybody, but maybe Chapman – maybe this a couple of days of rest gives him – maybe that gets fresh. Judges, that wrist feels good. I, I like everybody. Everybody's starting to feel good. That's going to be a big series. I haven't watched baseball oh, in years. Baseball. I watched this. I actually watched some of this last. This was a six two or card. seven two. The final. Yeah. I actually started watching that for the first time in years. I just lost interest in baseball. It was a great game. The when baby you, bombers uh, are pretty good. I thought they're calling yeah. them the baby bombers. When you are in any given Sunday, right? Yes. When you're uh, interviewing Willie Beeman, and it's when you know Willie Beeman's successful, so your character all of a sudden is this big fan, and you look at him and you say, "Your smack is so fresh." Was that your line or was that Oliver's line? No, it was mine. I love it so much. <laughs> but Jim, Rome, Jim Rome, to his eternal credit, let me hang out with him because it was kind of a... I made him halfway Jim and halfway Lenny Bruce. And it was back when the Museum of Broadcast had more information than maybe your iPad did. And so I went to the Museum of Broadcast and I watched all this Lenny Bruce stuff. And I just wanted to get his rat-a-tat-tat. And I wanted this guy to be really accelerated. And uh, so I, I stole that from Lenny Bruce. And then Jim let me hang out with him for... Uh, a day and a half when he had Rome is Burning on the Fox lot and then he had his uh, radio show over towards uh, uh, Burbank. And that was unbelievably useful. You yeah. really picked stuff up watching him do his thing and what like you just like what did you learn like cadence or certain uh, ways of addressing a sports situation? Yeah, just I just was getting Jim's vibe and that's what I want. I just want a vibe. Because these, these actors, you got to remember, every time you go in front of a camera, it's like the camera is an x-ray machine. It, it just sees right the fuck through you. And so if you can somehow find a way to reduce the, the profundity of the lie. What does profundity mean? He how, knows, but I don't. How, how, how <laughs> egregious the lie. I know. <laughs> how, how egregious <laughs> the lie is. Uh-huh. So in other words, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not Stan. I'm not Dr. Cox. I'm not Sergeant O'Neill. But for a platoon, Oliver put us through, through that three-week three boot camp. And that starts to reduce. Then you can take your leap, the leap of imagination as an actor. And then that reduces how egregious the lie is. And the camera buys wow. it just a little more. Uh-huh. And so if you can find a way to attach to this, whoever it is you're playing. I mean, De Niro put it on steroids during Raging Bull. He, he was Jake LaMotta. We, that's who he was. And so for, 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 for with Jim, I just wanted to get it on me a little bit. Okay. That I makes just sense. wanted to get the vibe on me. The line is so perfect because he's sitting there like he's, he's this obnoxious like sports host. And he's all ego for the first half of the movie. And then Willie Beeman starts to become this celebrity football player. And all you want, all your character wants to do is be accepted by him. All you want 100%. is Willie Beeman to think that you're cool. So you're trying to talk like Willie Beeman talks. And you say your smack is so fresh. 
And Willie Beeman is just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it, is, it is alien language coming out of the guy's mouth. <laughs> so him great. Trying, him <laughs> desperately trying to get some street cred. Yeah, exactly. It's just an exercise in being a jackass. I can't tell you how many times I've said that to people. And not half of them don't even know what I'm talking yes. about. But you just look at somebody. Your smack is so fresh. So fresh. Like, who says that? I did the same Ever. thing. I did this uh, film, uh, Set It Off, with uh, Latifah and, mm -hmm. and, and, and Jada Pinkett. And it's about these four women Robin Banks. And so I'm the cop chasing them. It's kind of a Harvey Keitel role. I'm sure he turned it down, and that's why I got it. But, <laughs> did you have a bad lieutenant car moment? <laughs> no, no, no. That ain't me. <laughs> and so uh, I, I have a, a female assistant cop, and she says something in the middle of the movie. And I say... Uh, do you feel me? And I want it to be very street, mm -hmm. but I don't want it to be street. Right. And so uh, that's that's another one of those moments yes. where I, 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 I found something and I was like, oh, I'm going to exploit the hell out of this. Yeah. You have to figure <laughs> out how to fake being fake. Yeah, because I can make it as street as you want, but... The character can't. Exactly. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. One, um, of, one of my favorite, real quick, one of my favorite parts you ever had was in Office Space when you play uh, that corporate guy that comes in that was to a clean good up gig. the company. So good. You played him so well. Just that goofy guy that comes in with that fake laugh. Uh, that was oh, a good gig. I call amazing. that a broker's laugh. You know how when you're looking at apartments with some broker and they're like, right. they, and, and you go, well, the bathroom's small. And they're like, yeah, but you're going to love it. And he's like, fuck <laughs> you, it's small. <laughs> I call right. it a broker's laugh. <laughs> yeah, but you're going to love it. <laughs> Did you know that movie was going to blow up? No, was... no chance. No chance. <laughs> I, I, right. I, I had, uh, Mike Judge was nice enough uh, to, at, fir at first that character was supposed to be down in Austin, Texas, which is where we shot it. Uh, it was boarded, which is film talk for how long you're going to be here. There's a there's a board, mm -hmm. and I was boarded for two weeks. But then out of nowhere, I get this Matthew Perry comedy up in Toronto for with Warner Brothers, and I was going to get paid. And so I called Mike Judge, and I go, "Could I?" But the two weeks was too much. I wasn't going to be able to go up to Toronto right. and do this thing for three months and be in Austin for the two weeks. So I said, "Mike, could we could we compress this a little bit?" And he's such a mensch. He totally did. I went down to Austin. I did. Uh, I traveled on Monday. Did wardrobe on Tuesday. We shot uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and I was in Toronto by Saturday. Wow. And the only reason that's great is once again, if you can all of a sudden just put those blinders on and for three days not come up for air and just stay in that. Yeah. Usually it's three months, which is much harder to stay in it. But for three days, we just were in that interior doing downsizing. We were downsizers. All of a sudden you get in, you start to get in a rhythm, whatever, whatever that rhythm is, you start mm. to find a rhythm and it's groovy. Not and gonna... that's what everything that could have gone right for those three days went right. Right. There was a lot of improvisation, um, which it, it, improvisation always works better if it's compressed. Yeah. If it goes on too long, there's a lot of fat on the bone. Right. Mm -hmm. And you start to embellish instead of driving through whatever you're starting to drive through and if you become good at improvisation you can embellish the living shit out of anything mm -hmm. and that's not going to make it in the film mm -hmm. right. Right. you know we got to go the film's 90 minutes we got to go or a comedy like office space and so that everything could have gone right for those three days did right yeah and well, that never happens 